In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. the grace and peace of God be with all of you in His Holy Church. Amen. And good morning everyone. Good morning. Uh, it's a great day uh, for us uh, here at Lawson, uh, and it's great to see the young and the uh, young at heart uh, gathered uh, in this uh, beautiful uh, church uh, and uh, to uh, experience uh, the love, the hope that uh, our God gives. And after the election in America, I think we do need a bit of hope and love. Don't we? <laughs> um, and um, I'd like to um, thank uh, Father Paul for his invitation to me to come to the mountain, the Blue Mountains, the beautiful part of it, of it here. You know, when Pope Francis began his uh, pontificate at the papal inauguration, the people gathered at St. Peter's Square and many of them carried banners that read, Go and rebuild my church. 
It was, of course, a reference, a re reference to uh, St. Francis' dream in which he was told to rebuild the church which was falling into ruins. Pope Francis, like his namesake, has uh, since dedicated himself to the task. It was such a, uh, a power symbol when he bowed and uh, asked the people for their blessing upon his Petrine ministry. It was a powerful symbol of a humble, listening and accompanying church, the new wine of God's unconditional love, boundless mercy, radical inclusivity and equality needs to be poured into the new wine skins of humility, mutuality, compassion, powerlessness, the old wine skins of triumphalism, supremacy, abetted by clerical power, superiority and rigidity are now broken. The servant leadership of Pope Francis is indicative of the new era of hope, even if we are struggling to find our way in the emerging and unfamiliar landscape. Transition times are inevitably full of chaos, uncertainty, and even confusion. As the Holy Spirit leads us in a new exodus, we are called to go forward into the future with courage, with hope. We need to remember that the tough times can be the blessed times. The church was not at its best, as some might think, nostalgically, when it reached the heights of imperial power in what was known as Christendom. The church instead was at its best when it was poor, persecuted, and powerless. Consistently, we, the true believers, are challenged to be the beacons of hope in the midst of pain, suffering, and despair. God's ways often involve the pain of letting go, beginning again, going forwards, even with uncertainty and chaos. And the, the Word of God this Sunday helps us to come to terms with our present situation and live it with such courage, faith and hope. It talks about times of upheaval and change, times of cleansing and purification. But it also encourages us to be vigilant, to hold firm and never lose heart. In the first reading, the prophet Malachi speaks about the burning anger of God. He uses ap apocalyptic language to describe the day of judgment. The wicked will be burned like stubble, but the sun of righteousness will shine like the sun is shining today on the just with its healing rays. It was common for the prophets of the Old Testament to speak about good and evil, rewards and punishment in this way. What we can learn from Malachi is that God continues to purify his people and he often uses pain and suffering as a means to test and cleanse us in order to make us more authentic, more true to our calling. And therefore we should not fear and shirk from testing times. Rather, we should embrace and grow through them. In the Gospel, Jesus talks about the impending crisis in terms of the challenges and adversities that his disciples must be prepared to face. Metaphorically, he speaks of the destruction of the old temple which will be the catalyst 
for a new Israel. The crisis that the deaths of the old will create will also bring believers an opportunity to bear witness to the new. The end time is not doom and gloom for those who believe. In fact, it can also be a blessing in disguise, the moment of purification and maturity of faith. So brothers and sisters, here at Lawson, just like the early Jewish Christians, we are told to take heart and to discern the way of God in times of crisis. The metaphor of the death of the old temple becomes relevant for us as we witness an emerging church from the ashes of the sexual abuse crisis and it took and rot the Royal Commission. Our churches may not be destroyed, may not be raised to the ground like the temple in Jerusalem that Jesus spoke about. But in many ways, the death of the old way of being church is already evident for all to see. Our reputation, our moral credibility, our trust capital are effectively destroyed. Destroyed in the wake of the sexual abuse crisis and which in itself is a vestige of the old triumphalist, colorless, innocent, um, self-sufficient, self self-contained, fortress church. And let us not be afraid of the death of the old. Let our hearts expand and accommodate the ways of God and let us become catalysts for renewal and transformation through our commitment and our engagement with the gospel values. Let us learn the art of living deeply in God's love, attentive to His presence and the times, the signs of the times and responsive to those signs of the times, then we can be the conduits of mercy and the sign of hope for all. He took bread in his holy and venerable hands, and with eyes raised to heaven, to you, O God, his almighty Father, giving you thanks, he said a blessing, brought the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took this uh, precious chalice in his holy and venerable hands, and once more giving you thanks, he said the blessing, and gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. Let us pray. We have partaking of, 
partaken of the gifts of this sacred mystery, humbly imploring, O Lord, that what your Son commanded us to do in memory of him may bring us growth in charity through Christ our Lord. Amen. Please be seated for a few words of gratitude. I'm a mystic man in the vision for driving up the mountain so early in the morning to celebrate with us and bless her and a renovated church. I remember with dread on Friday night when I drove back in May last year and the fire brigades were here. The fire was out, the place was full of soot and smell. The doors were smashed open and it's the little church that is nurtured and nourished this community, sanctified by the presence of God and by the people whose faith and hope make it come alive. It was awful. It was a few days before we realised the depth, the length of the stuff we needed to do to restore it. But the thing that really sticks in my mind was that first mass, that Saturday after the fire, the next day, you could smell the stuff. We gathered in the school hall. And we were all upset, angry. But the response of the people of this community, the people who destroyed Adam Church, our first response was to pray for them. And I think that sets the name for who we are as a people, and who we are as a church. And it was the men and women of this community who came together to bring life and renewal and new hope and express and stone and colour and wood in our community church where we gather to celebrate the Eucharist that tells us how to live. And I'm particularly grateful to the men and women of the parish in general for their support and particularly to the committee that came gathered together on many cold Friday nights to argue, to discuss, to dream of what our church could be. And in the midst of all the different ideas, over time, what we arrived at coalesced. And it came, not easy, but it came because of people's passion and desire. And the beauty of this community and the beauty of the gospel were reflected in the place where we gathered. And I'm immensely grateful to Sister Moyer, who was on the committee for Therese Stockton, who raised funds for our building. To Carol Tadori, who brought enthusiasm and a sense of colour and wonder. To Tony Gilmore and his wife Anne, who came to those meetings and spoke of hope and a vision of beauty. To Father Eugene, who spoke of a church and a community grounded in the reality of our birth and this place. To Bob Anderson, who brought his architectural skills to help us in our search for completion. For Terry O'Donnell, whose vision of the furniture spoke of the past but also of who we are and who we hope to become. And his son Sam, who crafted all this with his own hands. For Jeff Hubbard, who in the, even the midst of illness oversaw the whole project for months and months at a time. Even at times when he was so sick, he could hardly stand. Of course, of course, the indefatigable Paula Curry, the parish secretary, who, you hear me say it so many times, by the love and passion and enthusiasm, makes possible so much of what we enjoy as this community. So, we should thank you for your words today and your presence and your blessing. Thank you for leading our diocese as we progress into the new times that we face. This church is a reflection of this community's commitment to move with the gospel into our future. Grounded in the timelinesses of our faith, but also being aware of the signs of the times. This is an expression of our hope, our confidence, and our commitment to live with the gentleness of the gospel. So on behalf of our Lady of Nativity, I should see thanks to you.
for us, and the men and women of this community. Thank you for making this a place of joy, a place where all are welcome, a place where we come to celebrate the wonder of life and renew it with our God and rediscover it with one another. Thank you for your patience and for your faith and your commitment to our community.